Thank you. Um, I have just updated my front page because I think it's important that we acknowledge on this Easter Sunday that there have been a number of large explosions um, in Sri Lanka in churches celebrating Easter and at some major hotels in um, Colombo. So, <clears throat> blast injury is unfortunately um, one of the trauma challenges that many of us have to deal with in a world that has gone completely crazy. I work for the National Critical Care and Trauma Response Centre, and for those of you who weren't at my talk yesterday, um, it was uh, it's a national capability that provides Australia's health emergency response both nationally and internationally. We hold the cache of equipment um, to send out a level two field hospital and also run teaching, training and prepare personnel for deployment to health emergencies. We're uh, situated in Darwin, which you can see on that map is much closer to uh, Singapore than to the rest of Australia and it's actually quicker for me to go to Timor or Singapore than it is to go to Sydney or Brisbane. Um, so I feel much more a part of the Southeast Asian community than I do um, the Australian community. Um, so I did a crazy thing uh, when uh, after the Bali bombings I signed up to be um, on the RAAF Specialist Reserves, that's our Defence Reserves Corps and uh, shortly after I signed up they asked me whether or not and it was voluntary I would go to Iraq and uh, help fix broken people. So of course I said yes. So I worked in Balad Hospital which is uh, just to the north of Baghdad, probably about uh, I think it was 80 miles north of Baghdad. Um, the most dangerous stretch of road in uh, Iraq at the time and we were in a tent hospital facility that was classified as hardened even though it was a tent so we didn't have to go to shelters during the code reds. Um, we just stuck on Kevlar and kept working and the code reds occurred um, several times a day so incoming ordinances that were um, Fortunately, mostly uh, two out of three didn't explode because they were old ordinances that were coming across the border from other countries. And so uh, there was a lot of controlled detonations as well. But it was a scary place to be. The ED um, uh, is in the top picture there. We had five wards of 14 beds and three ICU wards of 10 beds that were split up into a coalition ICU, which was kind of like a transfer facility, six to 12 hours rapid turnaround. Um, and then the second ICU was the local facility for um, the Iraqi National Guards, police and civilians um, that were brought into us. And then we had to open a third ICU, which uh, took the burns patients um, in an attempt to get some kind of infection control for our serious burns. Um, there was three, there was one, uh, three operating rooms with six operating tables um, and so, you know, in disaster situations you need to learn how to operate outside of your normal comfort zone. So we had, uh, not only did we have two tables going at once with two surgical teams, but sometimes there were two surgical teams per patient one orthopaedic team at the bottom end and a neurosurgical team at the top end. And so everyone gets to learn how to work uh, well together when you're dealing with uh, blast injuries. This is what the enemy looks like. Um, the uh, mortars, um, so for those of you that are not au okay fait with this stuff, mortars, um, improvised explosive devices, um, this is a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device. This is the crater um, just outside the toilet block outside the ED that was created by a rocket that landed early in the morning just after shift changeover. Fortunately, the rocket didn't actually explode. Um, had it exploded, the hospital would have been gone. And so 
We mostly got our patients in from uh, chopper retrievals, either straight um, from the field or from the forward operating bases. But what we learned with disasters and blast injuries that when the patients arrive from the field, no matter what's been done beforehand, you have to start from scratch. You start from the primary survey and you continually go back and reassess and you expect to uh, miss injuries and find them over the next two or three days. That's not a failure of the system, that is, that is a success of the system because your um, goal in treating uh, mass casualties in a blast situation is to save life, save limbs, and then go back and clean up later. So it's uh, the principle of damage control. War wounds are very confronting um, and you know, you just need to have a really set, um, clear pathway through it uh, when you're, you know, in the moment dealing with it. Um, you need to be able to kind of block out the ho horrendous nature of what you're dealing with and just go straight into basic principles. So it is all about triage, doing the most good for the most people um, and getting on to the sickest people first and working your way through. So we had a very good triage system within the emergency department with the uh, um, surgeons doing surgical triage and the emergency physicians doing um, the resuscitation triage and sometimes patients, um, when the ED was overwhelmed, patients came directly to ICU um, to have that process done in the ICU. Airway breathing circulation, it's all about airway breathing circulation and then damage control, which we've talked about. So that repeated tertiary survey, expecting to miss, initially miss injuries that become apparent in the next 24 to 48 hours. My worst day was as the single doctor on in the ICU receiving 14 direct ICU admissions um, from the field in six hours. And it, unfortunately in a disaster, in a war zone, in a civilian disaster zone, your ratios get worse as you get busier. So there's no one-to-one -one nursing in ICU in a disaster. Um, it gets, you know, one to two, one to three, and, you know, often as this solo doctor or with one or two doctors, you are doing everything. You don't have a huge mass of people um, to get on with it. So this uh, situation was quite different from the fairly controlled circumstances I talked about yesterday, receiving the patients from the Bali bombings. And the thing you've got to know is that BLAST has almost unlimited wounding potential. Small holes hide very big problems. And explosions in confined spaces and with structural collapse cause greater morbidity or mortality. So if you've had an explosion inside a building, expect the injuries to be worse. The factors that affect the injury pattern are really the composition and amount of material involved. A lot of the IEDs, um, the improvised explosive devices, the suicide bombers, they ha they're filled with ball bearings, bits of rusty metal, bits of rusty wire, and, and that stuff is just deadly. It, it, it penetrates and causes a lot of damage. Um, the surrounding environment and environmental hazards where the explosion occurs, what the delivery method is, and then the distance between the victim and the blast has um, a big impact on the actual primary blast injury. And if there are any protective barriers in place, so the base that I worked on had a lot of concrete barriers everywhere so that, you know, if you heard incoming, you could um, duck behind a concrete barrier, which was... Um, <laughs> So this is the nuts and bolts of it. Blast injury is not a single injury. There are four ways in which you get injured. There's the pressure wave injury at the outset where all your gas-filled structures in your body are susceptible. This is where you get ruptured globes, ruptured eardrums, bowel injury, blast injury, traumatic brain injury, and you can have all of that without any external evidence of injury. Then you've got the missile injuries, the devices that contain ball bearings, wire and other scrap, explosions resulting in flying metal and glass from the structure that's been exploded, and then often the projectiles are irregularly shaped and lodged deep inside the body. And then there's the actual explosion injury, so arms and legs just get blown off um, and people get thrown by the explosion, so you get that momentum injury. 
And then you get the quaternary injuries, which is the burns from the explosion and things catching fire, crush injuries from things falling on you, and um, isolated injuries from falling debris. And one of the um, interesting things for an intensive care specialist is the blast lung injury that occurs. And often we saw this in patients who might not have looked like otherwise very badly injured, but they came in quite hypoxic and requiring long-term ventilation. So the blast wave causes immediate lung injury. It's um, the pathophysiology is rupture of alveolar capillaries, intrapulmonary hemorrhage and edema, a shearing injury um, both to alveoli and to pulmonary vessels. So you can get pneumothoraces, hemothoraces, and then what is essentially blast lung injury, an ARDS type picture. The severity is related to the magnitude of the blast explosion um, and the proximity of the um, person to the blast. And they present with the typical respiratory symptoms, tachypnea, dyspnea, cough, hemoptysis, and hypoxia. And the management of the severe lung injury is nothing special. So the, um, it took a little while for the military um, physicians to get it into the heads that this really was just a severe lung injury, much like ARDS. And if we just treated it the same way, then, then we would have success in getting these people through. So we mostly, we managed to get ourselves a proper ventilator. Um, we were running on impact, small, um, portable military ventilators to start off with, but we got a few dragers in for these patients, and that really revolutionised our ability to ventilate them properly. Um, and so with just lung protective um, strategies, we were able to get a lot of them through. And um, after I left, they did play with um, extracorporeal CO2 removal, but that didn't really make a big difference. Treating blast injury takes time and effort. So if you're in a civilian setting and you get um, blast injury patients into your ICU, they're going to be there for a long time. Um, this uh, patient is actually from the uh, Bali bombings. He had the second lot of Bali bombings in 2005, two laparotomies and three soft tissue debridements in the first three days. And then by seven days, some wounds closed with return to theatre every second day for changes of back dressings on his wounds. And then by day 30, he was able to be grafted um, and in the interim it had a couple of intra-abdominal abscesses and 16 returns to theatre. So they're complex patients and if you've got a number of these in your ICU, it's going to take up a lot of bed space for a lot of time. Small holes hide big problems, so most people would focus in this patient on the, you know, the face injury, but what actually was the problem was this small hole here. Um, where a ball bearing had um, dissected the carotid artery and he required urgent um, vascular surgery to save his life. This guy looks reasonably well, not too much gore, but you know, just these kind of little burn marks and a few pock marks. So this guy had multiple um, bowel perforations and an acute abdomen that took um, many weeks to get over. So in this situation, in damage control with blast injury, all the wounds should be left open and vac dressed in some way and looked at every one to two days in the OR. You get ongoing um, requirements for debridement. It's a little bit like managing necrotizing fasciitis where you have to just kind of keep going back, doing a bit more, doing a bit more, and you don't get it right the first time and you don't expect to. Um, and so you definitely do not close these wounds primarily when they present. So we saw about 353 critically injured patients in three months. Um, and it's interesting because one of the reports said a local hospital in Sri Lanka has seen 300 patients today from one of the churches. So it's, um, but it was, a, it was more critically ill injured patients um, than than anyone should see in one lifetime, really. Um, and these were, these were all ICU patients. Um, there were many more patients on the wards. We had 146 that went through a staging procedure to Germany, so they'd come in for six to 12 hours of damage control, packaging, and going out to Germany. And the US um, military health system could get someone from the 
forward operating base where an event occurred through Germany to stateside in um, less than 72 hours. It was an incredible transport system. But we had 207 non-coalition patients, um, about 60 military, 40 civilian in breakup, um, that just stayed with us for the duration. And so we had um, long stayers in the ICU. Um, a lot of limb injuries, head injuries, um, and uh, what we'd expect to see from uh, the... And we often couldn't, t and this, this might be surprising to some of you, we, sometimes we couldn't tell if somebody had a gunshot wound or had been involved in a blast when they first came in, if they came in without a story, because a lot of it kind of looked the same. So a typical blast injury patient, so this um, is a policeman um, who got a gunshot wound to his right flank, which took out his portal vein, um, his right ureter and uh, his duodenum, and he was with us in septic shock for about three or four weeks. Um, but eventually we got him up and moving and, uh, and out of the hospital, which was uh, great to see. Um, this poor gentleman, um, he, when he woke up, um, asked me to marry him, so I think he had an acquired brain injury, um, but <laughs> he uh, um, was at a police ceremony. They did these passing out ceremonies when people were very proud and they would get their certificates and, and they were targeted at these ceremonies. Um, and so a very typical pattern, uh, injury pattern, right eye lost, penetrating abdominal injury, multiple small bowel perforations, um, including the duodenum, and they were the terrible injuries that took a long time to get people better from. Um, and the left traumatic um, above knee amputation and a right knee injury, which was gonna make it very difficult for his rehabilitation. Um, and you see some awful things um, and, you know, disaster medicine is not for the faint-hearted and it certainly gets um, into your soul. So um, this poor, the young girl in the blue tracksuit was an interpreter for the um, uh, US military, a local interpreter, and so her mother was handed an IED at the front door of her house um, and ended up with us. So. Um, who, and she'd lost her um, left arm and had an abdominal blast injury and had lost her um, left leg. So they're awful, brutal injuries, um, multiple uh, systems requiring attention at once and you just, you really have to get very good at attention to detail in these patients because you just keep finding more things. So. Blast injury has almost unlimited wounding potential and it wounds not only the body but the soul and not only of the people that are injured but the people that are looking after them. Uh, it's important to have really good foundation disaster principles um, practiced and ready to go. Um, this is a specialised field and uh, it's definitely something that unfortunately more and more of us will be exposed to um, uh, while the world continues to go crazy. Thank you.